really the signs of trouble kind of come in two waves and we're most attuned to the second wave of signs and that's when there are behavioral manifestations. When a child stops behaving in school, let's say, and gets suspended or expelled or something like that happens. They get into a fight with their friends or, or something like that. And we're tuned to looking for those behavioral manifestations, but we really need to be looking a lot earlier than that, really years earlier. This live broadcast and live stream of Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Suicide is a complex public health problem that can have devastating and lasting effects on individuals, families, and for our community. In our island state, the leading cause of injury deaths among teenagers and young adults is suicide, outpacing car crashes, homicides, drownings, and unintentional poisonings. Joining us tonight to help increase awareness about suicide, how to recognize someone at risk, and where to go for help are a group of professionals and a volunteer who work with teens, their schools, and their families. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest, Dr. Deborah Gobert is a professor at the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. Miki Nishizawa is a student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and advisor for the Waipahu High School's Youth for Safety Club. Gina Kaulu Kukui is a certified grief counselor and the co-founder and program director of Life Bridges Hawaii Incorporated. And Kea Loha Hooper is the program direct coordinator for the Molokai Child Abuse Prevention Pathways. Thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate your insight. And Deborah, I want to start with you. You've worked in this space for three decades now. How are we doing as a state? So I think what we we're doing better, I guess, is the best thing to say, um, because we're talking about it more now, and we have more people involved in the effort. So we haven't seen a lot of change in the numbers over the years. It's been relatively stable, um, with some increases actually in our younger age groups. But, but the involvement of the community, involvement of professions um, has certainly increased over time. Gina, I know you've also been working alongside, uh, you know, in this area. What have you seen change over the years? How are we doing better? I think that Deb hit it right on the, you know, right on the head, is that more people are starting to talk about it. And by talking about it, what's really important is that we're starting to break the stigma around people that are at risk, for people that are at risk, but we're also breaking the stigma around mental health issues, making it okay for people to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. Kealoha and Mickey, I know you both work with youth. Uh, Kealoha, if I could start with you, uh, being on Molokai, what are the, some of the issues that face the teenagers that you see? Um, I think definitely the lack of resources. Um, being on a, uh, such a small island like Molokai, um, although it is recently starting to be talked about, I think uh, we do have education, but it's still at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so although um, for us, like our, our per capita is like smaller, but then our death by suicide is kind of the same everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So um, we still kind of lack that is um, we don't even have um, uh, behavioral health that's available mm -hmm. on Molokai. For some, for some of us, they have to go off island mm -hmm. and get that resources. So it's still, it's still tough for us in regards to finding resources that can help with that. But um, we, are, we do have um, some education program which didn't exist before, so that's a good start. Mickey, I know you're on the ground in the high schools. Uh, what are you hearing from the teens? What do they need? Well, I think one of the um, things that um, have kind of changed is that more teens are aware of sensitive topics such as suicide and whatnot. And, um, you know, they've used social media. Social media plays a key role mm -hmm. in how they communicate with others and how they feel about themselves. And so I think that is um, the main venue that we go to to seek, um, you know, to seek answers of what they need um, and what kind, of, what kind of assurance, what kind of encouragement, what kind of services we need to provide with them. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about social media tonight because it is such a big part of mm -hmm. this issue. Just so that we're all working with the same data, let's 
bring you some numbers tonight so that we all kind of have a working uh, something to work with. Let's go to that first slide. This is the cause of fatal injuries in Hawaii 2012 to 2016 of people between the ages of 15 and 24. And as we said in the intro, you can see there uh, suicide far outpacing motor vehicle crashes, poisoning and drowning. The interesting uh, is thing is the next three slides. Um, if you look at by county, um, as expected, because Oahu is the largest population center, Oahu has the highest number. Um, but if we flip the slide to the next one and we look at the uh, adjusted to per capita, it's actually Hawaii County and Kauai uh, that actually lead the charge. And that is something that um, I definitely want to dive into tonight. Just so that we also have a basis, this last slide is interesting. If we look at uh, suicide in Hawaii by age group, if we look at our numbers and then we look at the national numbers, both in young adults 20 to 29 and in teenagers 15 to 19, we are outpacing the national averages. So some, some tough numbers there. But um, Gina, let's talk about the rural communities mm -hmm. and why we're seeing Hawaii, and, uh, Hawaii Island and Kauai so vastly outpacing the rest. Well, I think Kilo had you know, touched upon that when he was speaking just a moment ago. First of all, resources because you know our resources are, are very limited and the few providers that we have the mental health providers first of all they're tapped and they're tapped out the other thing that a lot of people don't realize for our young adults in order for them to get the significant mental health support that they might need they have to be sent off island to oahu to get those services and so we're not treating the entire family unit we're treating the patient and then sending them home and if those parents don't have the tools that they need in order to continue to support the mental health <coughs> needs of that child, you're kind of in that vicious cycle. I think the other thing is education. Um, I mean, we're doing the very best that we can to get out and train people, but everybody needs to be trained on how to recognize somebody that's at risk. And I really believe that there's an assumption that it's, it's Dr. Deb, it's Kealoha or it's myself because we're kind of we're in that field and we're working with you know these high risk people but that's not true and I think you know here we have a perfect example of a young adult who got involved in a committee I mean in a club in a school activity in a club and realized that it was such a problem um, and simple conversations like parents having it with their children is such an important part of that so that they can begin to build that trust. Um, and if everybody can recognize somebody at risk, then we have a better opportunity to do prevention, save a life, and instill that hope. You know, on that issue of prevention, Kayla, I wonder if you would talk about this spam group that you were telling us about earlier before we came on the air tonight, which was a program to basically train peers. Tell us about that program and, and, and how effective you think that is. Um, I, I definitely think that program was very effective. Um, we had uh, a bunch of um, kids from the Molokai High School that was a part of this group called SPAM, and it was initiated by HCCI um, that had funding in, uh, that had funding um, allocated to different communities in regards to doing train the trainer and it was really based towards youth training youth which I thought was like just so brilliant when you think about it mm -hmm. um, it was even you are you training adults when it comes to suicide mm -hmm. prevention and like what Gina was saying is that we need to educate the community as a whole and create more of a culture of change versus like pinpointing individuals but um, that group uh, the youth group spam they they did a lot in, in the, the period that we were together, they did a lot. I mean, even when the program stopped, they would still come to my office mm -hmm. and I'd be like, okay, what are you guys doing here, over here? But for them, it wasn't something that just was that year. They wanted something to continue. And I think when the program came to Molokai, it came at a, at a great time because these kids were eager to learn. Um, so it wasn't after the funding was done, it was their community, it was their friends that they saw were dying by suicide. Mm -hmm. It was their family members that were dying by suicide. So for them, it wasn't just a project, it wasn't just a, a program, it was like, how do we create a bigger safety net for our, our friends and family? Because you know, like any other small island that we live in, is that when someone dies by suicide, or even attempts uh, suicide, it affects our whole island. Like Our whole island grieves um, mm -hmm. when it comes to something like that. So it's my, my uncle or my cousin or, uh, their brother, their sister. So it's it's something that's very impactful in regards to our community. So I thought the youth, 
the train the trainer was such a great concept um, in regards to really reaching out to our community in regards to that because it seems like people listen when kids mm -hmm. talk I think when you know when providers come and doctors come like people don't people don't listen no one cares I mean, no one in cares. fact we're getting ready to train uh, Waipahu high school and middle school students um, yeah. to be trainers as they want to start it at the beginning of next year so and what does that training look like what are we teaching those young people to look for and how to respond so um, the basic part of the training is really getting comfortable um, in talking about it and so a lot of it has to do with role playing and practicing mm -hmm. uh, because we're just not used to talking about this on a regular basis and having that conversation and listening right we mm -hmm. we we always ask oh how are you doing but we're walking on and not stopping to hear your answer right and it, so you smile and say I'm good right because that's what else can you say because obviously the person's already in the next room um, by the time that so it's it's you know taking that time and, and letting people know that it's going to take time um, and then we we do train them in like looking at um, uh, the more immediate types of of things changes in behavior Right? Are you sleeping too much? Are you not sleeping enough? Are, are you seeing changes where they don't want to hang out, where your friends don't want to go and hang out anymore? Um, are they mad at you all the time? Um, and, and a lot of times when your friends, you know, they're just mad, you say, okay, forget you. I don't need to hang out with you anymore yeah. then, right? And, then, and so you actually end up isolating them more when in fact that could be a sign that somebody's actually feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, well, um, to that end, <laughs> on the signs, we had an expert in our studio earlier this week, Paul Gianfrido, who is the president and CEO of Mental Health America. You know, when we tend to think about suicide, we tend to think of one event that triggers someone to take their own life. Mm -hmm. But his explanation was that this is actually something that actually takes a long time. Let's take a look. Well, uh, what I like to talk about and uh, ask people to think about is the fact that suicide is the ultimate stage four event in a mental illness, let's say. Um, nobody thinks about suicide one day and decides to uh, die by suicide the next day. Usually there's a long sequence of events that have occurred. And when we look at the kinds of stressors that have been in our lives over the last decade or two, um, you, you look at the fact that you know, there have been financial problems that a lot of people have had that didn't exist before, the rise of social media that has led to cyberbullying that didn't exist before, uh, the lack of social engagement people have when they actually can go on their computer and get all of their engagement artificially that way behind personas that don't really exist. These are the kinds of things that are different right now and the kinds of things that do form the foundation and the roots of a difficult environment for young people today. Um. I wonder if you would address that, this idea that it's a cascade of stressors as opposed to one event. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. we know it's not just one thing. It's <laughs> everybody's going yeah. <laughs> to start oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's all these things. And we, we did do, um, in preparation for a strategic plan that just came out that was um, requested by the legislature, um, which was our third strategic plan for the state, we actually met with youth and wanted to get their input into this. And they, they talked repeatedly about expectations that are put on them. And that's mm -hmm. sort of where they were, that's the starting point. It's mm -hmm. that they were feeling <laughs> that there are these expectations that they're never good enough. Mm -hmm. and they're not good enough, never good enough, can't meet that. Um, yeah, you got a B, but couldn't you have gotten an A? Or yeah, you know, like, so it was something a little bit more, whatever it was. Um, just a little bit more like and and I, I think it was done with the intent of trying to push someone in a positive way right in terms of yeah you can do better I'm really proud of you you can do better and it was interpreted you're not good enough mm -hmm. um, and so that's like that's the base starting there and they they said that starts very young well I'm I'm just kind of reflecting when I think about um, my grandchildren. For example, I have a four-year-old and all the way up to 19, and you can, it, it's very prevalent. Um, you know, my granddaughter, I heard her brushing her hair, actually saying, I'm not that pretty. And she's beautiful. I mean, not just because she's my granddaughter, she's beautiful. And it was like, no, that's not true. Don't let anybody, you know, and giving her the positive, you're very beautiful, look at your eyes, and, and reaffirming Right, N not just hey, you know, that she's thinking it, but just reaffirming it's not true. And so every morning, it's waking her up, saying, "Hey, good morning, beautiful. Let's get those bright eyes up and get going." Um, but it's so much more than that. It's it's the you know it's everywhere. You look you know it's clothes, it's it's appearance, it's 
there, there's so many different stressors. What you're putting on social media. Exactly, <laughs> what you're putting on social media. But also, uh, there are other things that contribute to that. We have, um, we live in an economy now where there's, you know, the, a lot of the younger generation, especially on our neighbor islands, where parents, both parents have to work in order to afford to, you know, to live on islands. So a lot of our young kids, if their parents can't afford to send them to an after school program, they're latchkey children. And so they're not coming home, you know, to an adult that's, you know, that nurturing, here's your cookies and here's your milk, or what kind of a snack do you want? So that kind of aspect is missing. If you've got a divorced parent, if you have domestic violence in your home, um, if you're going to a new school and all of a sudden your friends aren't there anymore, I mean, that's where, it, you know, there's a death in the family. I mean, that's where this cumulative you know, I call them layers of loss come in because they're dealing with this loss and this change and disappointment. And yet if they don't have this core where they're feeling good about themselves, I think it creates, you know, some challenges and puts some of the kids, not all of the kids, I don't want to say that, but it puts a lot of these kids at risk. Ricky, what kind of stressors do you see in the students that you speak with? Well, I think definitely, um, I think it, they have, it is scary to, learn more and be, become more, have like a little bit more anxiety of dealing with the issue, only because the more you learn, the more you, see, the more you realize that it could be anyone, mm -hmm. that we could be passing by each other every single day. And I think that's what really got the students now thinking is that they've really started to um, kind of contemplate on the idea that, hey, this, could, this student could be someone that we have in class every day and is the happiest person there. Um, but we don't know what's happening outside of class, outside of school. Mm -hmm. And I think with the pressures, adding on to the pressures and the, the expectations from social media and society, it all just builds up. And, and it's important that we realize that it's the little things that build up into um, you know, that ultimatum of contemplating. So. Uh, we have some viewer comments and questions coming in, and of course we do invite you to participate, whether calling the 1-800 number or, um, of course, on social media. Uh, much of what makes suicide a tragedy, this viewer writes in, worse than other deaths, i.e. sickness, old age, etc., is society's anti-suicide stance. The anti-suicide ideology requires people to experience a suicide as a tragic and unnatural, which unheightens and lengthens the grieving process by making it feel like a uniquely mm. unfair loss. How do mm. we uh, take away the stigma when, when we talk about this? I think uh, the main thing is just really kind of educating people on it, mm -hmm. like taking the stigma away is like educating it and um, creating that, that, that culture of change. Because if not, you're always going to have that tabooness about it. So I think definitely um, education is key. Um, prevention is key in regards to that. So, You know, I mean, I think one of the issues here is that people feel like if they talk about suicide in some way, they might, in, in, uh, you know, inadvertently <laughs> encourage it. Um, I know that, you know, I worked in news media for a long mm -hmm. time, and when there's a death by suicide, uh, you tend not to report it mm -hmm. because you don't want to inspire any copycats. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we address that? How do we talk about this without uh, compelling someone to take their own life? So what we want to do is talk about it uh, on a very personal level. So you want to talk about it to your neighbor. If you know somebody mm -hmm. in, that, you know, died by suicide in your neighborhood, you know, people tend to avoid them. Mm -hmm. And so now we're now isolating another person, right? right? And, and that's a, a conversation we do want to have. We want to talk to the person, go over, let them know, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, that is something we would say to anyone, right, that has lost someone to, to death. Um, we want to invite people back into our communities if they've made an attempt. Um, again, they, you know, they're not contagious. That's not a plague. It's <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree. And I think, I think the biggest thing, and being a survivor myself, is that everybody wants to know why. And they, you know, they, they have to have a reason that somebody would die by suicide. And that's not a question that survivors can necessarily answer. Again, what we're hearing and what we know about that is it's cumulative. And that might have been, we hear a lot about cyberbullying or bullying. Oh, well, they were bullied and that's why. Well, the bullying might have been the last straw for that person, just the, what tipped the cart over. But there were so many other things that might have been going on along the way that, as she shared, that we didn't know about beforehand. And so, but um, we don't do that really in any other death. 
You know, we don't say if Deb had a loved one die by cancer, well, you know, was it lung cancer? I mean, was it because they smoked? We don't do that. We can accept <laughs> cancer because cancer happens within our body. And, you know, I don't mean to get on my soapbox, but <laughs> my brain is part of my body, and that's part of the stigma, right, is that we have a preconceived idea of what somebody that's dealing with mental illness might look like, but yet it could be any one of us here that is dealing with mental illness, and we know that that is a chemical imbalance and that sometimes we need medication to take care of that chemical imbalance that help us out, just like with any other chronic illness that we might be dealing with but we forget that. And if we can let people know that, that there's nothing wrong, there's nothing to be afraid of, and that you know, we know that, what is it, 90% of people that die by suicide have an undiagnosed mental health disorder. Wow. And so if we can, again, make it safe for people to go and get the, the medical help <clears throat> and the mental health support that they need, they can be functioning and high functioning and be productive you know, community members, but we don't. Um, I think there might be a lot of people watching who are either parents, grandparents, aunties, community members who might be worried about a young person in their life and wondering what are the things I need to look for. So on that end, we wanna go back to uh, Paul Gianfrido. We have another soundbite from him on the things that parents can look for. Take a listen. People need to have comfort in the present and hope for the future. And if you take away both of those things, you take away their comfort with their present circumstances. They're just challenging, they're difficult, week by week, month by month. And then you take away some of the hope they have for a brighter future. Then you've really put two things together that are very dangerous to put together in a person's life. And unless you can address the causes of those things and, and give them comfort and hope, we're gonna have problems. Comfort and hope, but we talk also about how stressed the parents can mm -hmm. be. Uh, what are some of the things that our, our youth are carrying on their shoulders that might not have that comfort and hope? Uh, I think, a, I mean, a lot. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, I guess to narrow that really is what's different about now? Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about social media, the good and the bad. How much of a difference does that make? You know, also, we, we, you know, we referenced our economy that our parents, that our, you know, it's so expensive to live in Hawaii that a lot of families are working two, three jobs per parent. So what, what, are, what are some of the things our teens are facing that maybe they weren't facing 10, 20, 30 years ago? Um, see, I, I definitely think, like, you know, uh, suicide was definitely an existent Many years ago, I think it's just that no one talked about it. There was like that stigma around it. Like, kind of going back to what we were talking about, it's like when you go to therapy, people think that you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So that the, the concept of therapy or, or behavioral health or going to see mental health is like makes you seem like you're not well, and people don't want to talk to you. They want to be around you. So that stigma right there is like you know we don't take we go to the dentist take care mm -hmm. of our teeth. Our teeth is not good. But then again, it's shameful to go to the therapist to fix your brain because your brain is not good. But we don't have that concept around it. Because I know where I'm at Moloka, if you went to therapy, something was definitely wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, but as for kids nowadays, I definitely think it was something going on then, but it wasn't as um, magnified as it is now. Right. But social media really plays a huge role in that. Um, having parents work both jobs, I think beforehand used to have at least you know a mother at yeah, home or someone at home, a grandmother at home, but now you have both parents gone and just one parent gone. So I think our kids are dealing with a lot of um, a lot of issues and a lot of um, things and not knowing how to cope with that, I think, is a big thing. One of the um, actual proven strategies for suicide prevention is a really simple thing, and it's actually having dinner together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as mm -hmm. a family. And it's a time to talk about what's going on in your yeah. day and, and, and that type of thing. And, and, and it's not that you even have to do it every single day mm -hmm. or you have to make the meal, right? It's just about getting together right. at a time on a regular basis and having a conversation. Um, and that's happening less and less. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with that. Um, <laughs> and, and, but I think what you said, Deb, was really important earlier on. You said, when we say to somebody, how, how are you? We're already walking away before they answer. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really do think that, you know, not just being at the t dinner table, but really listening. And I always use my poor son is going to be rolling his eyes, but he, when he was going into the ninth grade, he's 20 now, he got mad at me and he was going to go off into his room and slam the door. And when he walked by me, he said, I wish I could die. 
Now, I know my son. And I could have just sort of thought, ah, he's just, you know, he's mad at me. He's just blowing off some steam. But I actually stopped my son and I said, you know, are you thinking about suicide? Well, then he did roll his eyes at me. And he said, Mom, you know, I just said that because I was angry. But my immediate response was, well, how would I have known if I didn't ask the question? And I think that that's one of the things that you're referring to, Kealoha, is that one of the things that we are doing is that as we break that stigma, we're getting more and more comfortable. And that's what we want people to know, is that you have to be willing to ask that question. Because his response was, well, no, why would you think that? Well, you said it. And ultimately, since that five-minute conversation, my son, son went on in his four years at Kamehameha to have two people in his life that became friends. And because he had a different level of awareness, both those people, one in his ninth grade year, one, one in his um, senior year, both were thinking of ending their lives. And he was able to talk to his trusted adult to intervene. And those, both those boys are doing well now as a result of that. And that's really the pebble in the pond effect that we want to see. So having those dinner conversations are very important. Not only how was your day, um, well, how come, what didn't go well and why not? And how can I be of support to you? How can I make it better? And if it's not me, what about grammar? What about your coach? Or what about your kumu? You know, there, we don't have to be the trusted adult as parents. We think we have to be, but we have to make it okay <laughs> for our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephews to identify who their trusted adult is and not mm -hmm. have attitude. Right, ownership. No, I, right. I understand. Yeah. Uh, we have more viewer questions, and of course, we want to include the audience in, in our discussion tonight. Uh, what the, this viewer writing in saying, suggestion to ban cell phones in school due to peer pressure, bullying, the perseverance of social, the permanence of social media photos, which leads to helplessness and suicide. Uh, Mickey, I wondered if you would address this. Uh, I mean, banning cell phones seems pretty difficult to do, but how do we regulate social media? Well, I mean, I, I guess there's different ways you can go about it, and maybe you guys have um, better input on this. But I think um, outside of social media, there there are conversations, um, and it's just the expectations are already there, are already set, um, and we already have common knowledge of, um, you know, what what others are, what others expect of one another, and what others may be going through. And so, I think as a high schooler, I remember there is this comparison of what we were going through, like our hardships. So if I was going through academic troubles and balancing time out, there was always someone who was going through the exact same thing but um, had to work a part-time job at the same time. And so those, that kind of competition <laughs> kind of feels about like, oh, I should be able to handle this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think we, the social media part um, has already instilled in the students that there are others that are going through um, the same thing or even worse things and that itself cannot cannot is outside of social media is out of our control so yeah I mean as someone who didn't have a cell phone in high school because they weren't around <laughs> um, you know I just think about feeling like you're missing out you know mm -hmm. knowing that there was a party or that everybody went to the beach and I didn't get to go how, how much does that play in this I think feeling that other right. people are mm -hmm. up to something that I didn't get included in because mm -hmm. then that, that singles you out again Right. Yeah, so you don't have something that everybody has that singles you out again and that makes you like this oddball, um, you know, but I, it's hard, it's hard. I, I, it's like, you know, we talk to parents, uh, the work I do is in regards to sexual violence and we talk to parents about monitoring their kids' phone, like monitoring their phones. Um, I don't think you can get rid of social media or, mm -hmm. you know, because if you even take away your phone from like your kids, it's like they're going to get their, get it through their other friends right. or a computer right. at school. So it's kind of hard to really kind of restrict that from the kids. But I think if parents are, if parents monitor their child's phones, I think you can gain a lot from that. I don't think you can take that away. They're going to get it someplace else. I mean, they have like, you know, everything from Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook. Those are yep. just the three that I know. <laughs> um, but there's tons of other ones, yeah. tons of Snapchat. other ones. Snapchat. Snapchat. <laughs> It's so very hard to monitor because yeah. it disappears. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. I think monitoring it and, and, and just being involved in your child's social media. Um, part of our parent education for our sexual violence program, um, Molokai, is that we do we teach parents how to um, 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 
learn emojis and what those means. Um, learning if your kids is actually um, sending those sex messaging out to um, um, mm -hmm. other people or other people sending to them. So we educate parents on what emojis look like or them together, how, what does that mean? And parents are like in shock. I was in shock when I did it. Um, <laughs> but educating yourself, keeping yourself up to date, whether mm -hmm. we like it or not, it's like we're living in this age where everything is always progressing. Right. If we're not always thinking like, you know, we have to stay the same or keep the same, we're kind of living in a, you know, a fantasy world because it's not happening. So I think educating ourselves, educating as parents, as our kupunas, um, just educating so that way we are kind of involved in our teen's life, our youth's lives in regards to that. But I think limiting social media, it's not going to happen. Like, it's <laughs> very know. hard. It's very hard. Well, this yeah. is an interesting perspective. I, wa I want to bring you in on this. How do you deal with a teen who routinely uses the threat of suicide as a way to get their way mm -hmm. when they have no intention of following through? Uh, in other words, how, how do you know, you know what those cries for help really mean? Yeah, so it act, we actually take every single mm -hmm. time somebody says that seriously. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if they're threatening it, there's still something going on that they're not able to deal with. And so maybe we just haven't identified what it is yet. And so um, you just, you have to take it seriously because if, if they do make an attempt or then you know you want to have done something so. well it goes back to uh, what, what Paul had said earlier that it is a cascade that right. it does it's not one event yeah. and, and then that mm -hmm. leads to the suicide um, can you tell us a little bit about how many attempts usually or and, and how long someone has been thinking about this before it actually happens so um, we do see uh, certainly more people seriously consider it um, in the state for our high school aged youth it's about one in six and for our middle school youth it's one in eight Wow. Um, one in eight. But then when it goes to having made a plan, which is now taking, I've been thinking about something and moving it to kind of a behavior, um, it's, it's one in seven. Hmm. So it's still, these are high numbers, right? If you think of a classroom, we're still talking about, you know, three, four students in every classroom. <laughs> wow, wow. And, and when you say middle school, I mean, we're talking sixth graders. Sixth, mm -hmm. sixth to eighth graders. Yep. Yeah. That That's where we've actually so, seen, so the, seen the um, increases. Um, and again, I think, you know, everybody's expected to grow up quickly, mm -hmm. right? So it's just, we're just changing the age, age of that. Um, I do want to give a hopeful note, um, and that is that 85% of youth do tell somebody that they're thinking about it. So mm -hmm. we, we actually have opportunities to, to stop it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, again, in terms of what Paul was talking about, he was actually saying, let's even get it before that. Um, and if we look at, um, and, and they're just looking at depression as sad depression, it's one in three high school students mm -hmm. say they felt sad for two weeks, which is kind of our signal for depression. Mm -hmm. But if we add to feeling sad, feeling worried, feeling angry, feeling, scared um, right then uh, then we are you know we might be better able to address even those things earlier mm -hmm. um, but again going back to listening I just uh, that one of the programs that we have which is a training in the schools um, developed by Mental Health America of Hawaii is called Ho'olohe Pono which means listen well mm. <laughs> let's uh, let's hear a little bit more perspective from Paul about what to uh, the, the things that parents can also look forward to and the thing to look for in teens. Let's take a look at that. Really, the signs of trouble kind of come in two waves, and we're most attuned to the second wave of signs, and that's when there are behavioral manifestations. When a child stops behaving in school, let's say, and gets suspended or expelled, or something like that happens. They get into a fight with their friends or, or something like that, and we're attuned to looking for those behavioral manifestations, but we really need to be looking a lot earlier than that really years earlier. And if we look at some of the internalizing factors that are a little different uh, for kids who are going to be experiencing some significant mental health challenges, what we find is an increasing sense of isolation, um, sometimes an inability to attend to teachers uh, when they are do have consequences for bad behaviors, whether they're carrots or sticks, that they don't seem to learn from those things. Um, when they themselves are friendly kids but don't seem to feel as if they're making a lot of friends, they have difficulty sleeping, difficulty focusing, uh, difficulty with changes in eating patterns. All these kinds of things put together uh, collectively really signal the kind of internalizing factors that ought to bring our radar up. 
you know, Paul's laid out there a, a myriad of issues. If you see a young person struggling, and of course we know that the teenage years are tough no matter what. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be the most popular kid in school and still be having a very hard time. Um, but the kind of, the level of angst that he's describing is above and beyond. When a, when a young person is in that state, how do we reach them? Yeah, and actually part of the symptoms that they're feeling make it harder to reach, Yes. right? Because they're, they're pulling into themselves. Um, and, and so again, it's just giving that time. It's the non-judgmental attitude um, that you're allowed to feel this way, actually. We're not trying to say, don't feel this way. And I, I have a 16-year-old, and I'm sure he is rolling his eyes at me <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> it's just like, no, it's not OK. You know, it's been two weeks, and if you're not going to talk to me, you're talking to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, that's kind of the cutoff period that we're looking at. And, mm -hmm. and it's not that there, we're, there's a problem with feeling that way. It's that. Um, we need to, to take some kind of action. And, and from a parent's standpoint, it's the frustration you feel with, mm -hmm. with not being able to do that. Um, and again, I think um, in terms of what Gina was saying, it, it's probably not me. I'm probably part of the problem, um, as loving a mother as I am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, Mickey, I wonder if you would address that. Perhaps the parent isn't the best person necessarily to reach out to someone who's in that state. Perhaps it is a peer. If you're, you know, if you see a friend going through that, what do you advise the people in the group that you're advising to to reach that person if they are in that level of distress? Right. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned to being a part of part of the uh, suicide prevention council is to start a discussion. Um, again, like Deb said, you know, make make it okay, make establish safe zones for them, so that they can find that safety net, they can establish support networks, and that they know that people are there to listen, to hear them out. Um, and so, you know, starting discussions, making sure that it's okay, um, a non-judgmental zone, um, where they can, you know, schools is a, is a great place to get it started at because, you know, we spend, they spend majority of their, their mm -hmm. day every single week there. So um, many of them do find schools as their second home. And so it's, it's only natural that we establish those, um, those zones in the schools and um, you know, find that peer-to-peer -peer support. And Kay Aloha, at the start of this, you talked about that student group that you led. What kind of outcomes did you see just from having that cohort on Molokai? Uh, I, I think um, the, the outcomes in regards to it being successful is like um, the words um, that people use, yeah? Um, and I kind of gonna like refer this back to like, you know, certain, like, you know, we we're giving certain curriculums to do certain things, but that may work well in Oahu, but that mm -hmm. does not work well in Molokai, mm -hmm. um, or work well in Kauai, right. or work well in Nanakuli, Wainai, mm -hmm. Hana, wherever it may be. So I feel like you can say anything you want to do to create that conversation and start that conversation, but it's how you use those words or what kind of words you're using. Because sometimes when you talk to a certain group of kids, you have to use a certain type, like words. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when you're talking to our local boys, you have to use certain types of words mm -hmm. to create that because they're not going to, they're the ones suffering a lot when it mm -hmm. comes to that. A lot of times, I, I would say, a lot of our, our young women are very um, more in tune to speaking up about it. But when it comes to our boys back at home, it's like, you know, you're going to sit down with them, try to talk to them about that. It's like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> but you're you, right. You got to, it's the word. So taking what it is, is using those verbiage and using those words to relate to them. And like what Deb was saying, like if you as a parent are one of those that like knowing that your kid is suffering from you know, being depressed for so long period of time, if you cannot help your child or you feel like you're making the situation worse for them, mm -hmm. find somebody that can relate to them or can talk to them. Like if I cannot talk to a certain type of person, I will find somebody that can. And a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of time my, my friends will say, you know, how do I talk to this person? I say, you know, it seems like you're annoying them more, or it seems like you're <laughs> aggravating the situation more. Yeah. Why don't you talk to his friend, or why don't you talk to his cousin? He seems to hang out with him a lot, or, or she seems to relate to her more. So if you cannot find, um, you feel like you cannot help them, find somebody that can help them. Right. Like, don't think you are that superhero, right. or don't try to be that superhero that's not wanted, mm -hmm. um, you know? so find another vessel to go through because it will be successful. Because like right. you said, like parents, maybe that trigger or maybe the <laughs> aggravation that may be adding to it, right. um, but find somebody that can do it. Learn to speak their language or adapt yourself mm -hmm. to something because it's not going to work if you're trying to say, this is a proven curriculum, this works, this works, I've seen it work, this and that. 
But yes, it does, but you have to be able to adjust it to the given audience. Well, it's interesting because you talked about girls versus boys and being in touch with their feelings and, and um, you know, sort of subgroups within teens as right. a whole. Mike from Kauai would like to know, and, and I'll kick this to you since it is your, <laughs> your island, um, what percentage of teenage suicides are LGBTQ youth? How do we reach them? That's a really good question. We, we've had, you know, certainly our, our, our share on Kauai. Um, I, I think that Kealoha just actually spoke about that. What we have to do is if, you know, if, if that's not my comfort zone, I mean, if that's not my area, um, then I need to find the person that is. Who is the link in our community, All right? And we have a lot of really wonderful people in our community that really provide a fabulous, fabulous support um, safety net for, for, that, for that particular group. Um, I think it's everyone in general, not just a particular group. Like you were saying, men. I mean, obviously, I mean, my 15-year-old grandson won't let me kiss him. That's just not, that's not cool, you know, for me to be kissing him. So, of course, that's not what I'm going to do, right? In private, maybe I'll ask permission. Can I give you a hug? I really miss you today, right? Doing something that's at his level. So it's the same thing with our LGBTQ community, right? It's like, who, who do they look to? Who do they identify with? How do we then engage that person or those people and bring them in. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what, you know, the training and the connect and um, really the prevention is all about is who are some of these key people and if they're not trained and they're not brought in, how do we bring them in? Because that's who they're going to, right? And that's what we have to do. We have to find out who are they talking to. And if they're talking to their peers, then this is a perfect opportunity for us right, to bring um, education to those peers so that, again, we can bring that safety net. And once that trust builds, guess what? The pebble in the pond will expand. Mm. Deborah, I think this is a question for you from Nancy in Honolulu. She says, and we've been talking about the issue of uh, rural versus urban communities tonight. The rate is highest for teen suicides on Hawaii Island. One, what is causing this? And two, is there anything we can do? I mean, I'm sure that it's a very complicated mm -hmm. answer. But in a nutshell, yeah. to answer Nancy, what is causing this? Why Hawaii Island? So um, it, it actually moves around from any year to year in terms of which of the neighbor islands are going to yeah. be the highest. Um, and unfortunately, the Big Island um, has had the highest rates for the last couple years. Actually, uh, Kauai um, had the highest rates a few years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, even if we divided up Oahu into uh, urban and rural areas, we would see higher rates in our uh, rural areas. So certainly there's something about being rural, which was spoke to in the beginning. Um, in terms of what's happening on Hilo now, um, on, on the, you know, or just the, the, because it is, it is on the east side that the higher rates are, um, I, I'm not sure we know. I mean, uh, we, there's certainly still more of a depressed economy there than mm -hmm. there is in other places. Um, there's something and it, and it's not doesn't have to do with talking about suicide but it does have to do with something that we call the legacy and a legacy is if you know somebody that died by suicide then perhaps suicide becomes an option in your mind mm -hmm. um, and and that is probably at play we we certainly know you know everybody is related to somebody mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, so, and then that goes back to what we were talking about, about taking the stigma away, acknowledging that someone right. has died in this way, mm -hmm. but also not wanting to, you know, inspire. I mean, that, right. that is sort of a, a, yeah. a, a you know, a right. rough slope to, I don't know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, very a tight We don't want there. to focus on how they died, really. The, the, the process of healing from any death is not how the person died, but rather how they lived. And that's really what we want to do, especially when somebody dies by suicide. We just don't want to. And, and I think that's what makes it hard for families that are grieving the death of somebody that died by suicide, because again, it's the why. We want to find some, either, we want to find a fault. Either someone's at, oh, well, his girlfriend broke up with him, or, you know, or, you know, she was being bullied in school. We want to find a reason. And we spend so much time on trying to focus and figuring that out that we do lose sight of how that person lived. And I think that if we can encourage survivors to do that, I think we break the legacy. Mm. 
Mark and Kona writing in, do you have statistics related to Keiki that participate in after school activities versus those that have idle time? I mean, one of the things with a rural community is that there are fewer resources. Maybe mm -hmm. there are fewer things for young people to do. How, how are you addressing that? Um, I definitely think after school programs are very helpful for kids. It keeps them active, it keeps them busy, it keeps them out of trouble, um, and, and, and then it kind of links them to other things. Um, um, other th I had like kids that were in our, our spam youth group that when we first started, you know, um, we always started off with questions, you know, about like, you know, where do you see yourself in five years, where do you see yourself in ten years? And a lot of them in the beginning said, oh, you know, working, um, working at our, our grocery store or, you know, just working with my dad and then now I see a lot of them in college so it kind of opened up the door and I'm not going to say just from the program itself but any af after school program really helps initiate that or becomes like a, a stepping stone for kids to do something more. Um, I want to get to a lot of these questions tonight. So <laughs> how do we teach students to not use phrasing like I'm going to die as slang but rather find alternatives to communicate with their friends? Most students are simply mimicking what is heard from adults. How important do you think the language is? I think it is very important. Um, you know, we, I still to this day, you know, constantly see these acronyms like KMS, Kim Myself, and, um, you know, just these things that are used um, without much care, I guess. And so um, I guess it, it, and it makes it really hard to, again, to identify whether this is an actual sim um, a symptom or not. And, um, I think it's important that we address that, that we put in education and prevention um, to, you know, let them know that, you know, there are different ways to go about it. There are different ways to express yourself um, without using those terms and phrases. Yeah, I think one of the areas that you see that in a lot and, and um, like my son, everybody talks about I'm going to suicide myself on their video games, which is a way to say they're going to reboot, right, because they're playing. Um, and so that's become standard language and it's like no first of all that's not a verb <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna remember that one <laughs> Yeah, but, but word, words matter. Words matter. Right. Words right. do matter. Right. That was interesting when, when you said words matter it, it made me think of my little uh, um, you know seven-year-old grandson of Kone. I was he was I thought he fell asleep on the, my couch and I was watching CSI and I had to use the restroom and I run out and I come back and I thought, oh, I missed the most important scene. I don't know what happened and he opened one eye and he said, he suicided. <laughs> and I was, I, I was actually shocked because, okay, here's a seven-year-old child and I'm, you know, this is my love work and education and prevention, but it also gave us an opportunity in the morning because he did fall back asleep to have a conversation but again that word is becoming more and more common so there are advantages to that but then like you said it's not a verb and I'm sure he's heard his brother who's playing video games use that word so we have to you know take those things into consideration for me if I'm hearing my grandkids or any of my kids or anybody using that word or putting it on their media I'm gonna ask them every single time I see that and if they're saying no I'm not, grandma, it's just a statement, or it, that's not really what it means, then I'm going to encourage them to find other, come up with a new slang, you know, be, be a trendsetter. <laughs> because guess what? This is what it means to me, and this is what it's going to mean to every adult and youth that I come in contact with. So I'm hoping all your friends are asking you too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Important. Um, anonymous writing in, what nationality has the most suicides here in Hawaii? What impact does our cultural differences have on bullying, i.e. if a child is has smaller build or cannot speak English well, et cetera? Are there specific subgroups mm -hmm. that we see that are more affected in this area? We do, but it's hard for us to pull it apart um, in terms of that. So we do, we see it in our rural communities, and as a result of being in our rural communities, we see higher rates among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders because that's where they live. Uh -huh. So is it because mm -hmm. they're Native Hawaiian, or is it because they live in rural areas? Um, we've tried to pull that apart. I did actually do do research in my real life, <laughs> 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 and um, we looked at we looked at a hundred different variables. And we still were only able to explain 15% of people that make an attempt. Mm. I mean, that that was looking at all types of different things. So, um, so I, I wouldn't. I'm, it is higher in those communities, but I don't know that that's because of that particular cultural mm. um, aspect. I do think we, um, when we've talked about, you know, 
size and bullying. Though we know from a bullying standpoint, certainly, that those are things that can make somebody um, more likely to be picked on. So all of these groups that we, we talk about in terms of uh, LGBTQ plus or uh, size or disability, right, mm -hmm. they come up. Um, and so their exposure to certain types of um, uh, events, which again, build upon each other, may make it a little bit higher as well. I mean, what strikes me about <laughs> what all of you are saying is that we need to be more community oriented, that it's not just the parents uh, or that it's not just the best friend, it's, mm -hmm. it's all of us together. How do we inspire that kind of collective consciousness? Kalo, I wanna, wanna start with you. I mean, how do we get involved without interfering? Um. I think sometimes you have to interfere to get involved. <laughs> um, I agree. Yeah. And maybe that's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and that, that's, I, I think that's just one of those things. Like, um, I, I honestly never thought I would be in the field that I am in regards to prevention work. Um, but I think it's very important, um, even starting with simple conversations. Right. Like, you know, how come you guys are using those words? Um, um, I used to say like, oh my God, all the time. And my sister used to say, stop saying that, stop saying that. <laughs> then every time she started saying that, I always was conscious about saying it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I should probably stop saying that. So now I stop saying the word, yeah? But it's having that constant reminder about what something means, I think is important. Or having that conversation and looking for um, um, avenues to have it. Like, right. you know, having that, you know, Gene's grandson said that, like, you know, having a conversation about that afterwards. But mm -hmm. a lot of time we, we tend to like, you know, brush it aside. But I think having the conversation and building that conversation is definitely important. What's the advice that you give to, to we're wrapping up soon, so I wanna make sure that you all get a closing thought in because you have so much knowledge at this table, but what do you say to young people about addressing their peers? You know, some people might be a little bit nervous or apprehensive about going up to someone at their, their own age. Right. I think it comes down to just the power of the youth voice and I think that's how we get the community involved is because the there's community members and leaders who are interested in the topic but they can't they themselves can't answer the question of how and so it does give that positive attention that the youth are starting at it and so it really I mean one of the things that I've struggled with was I don't have personal experience you know I'm not qualified I'm not um, I'm not the best person to talk to about it and do something about it, but really any age, whether you have experience or not, you can do something about it. Um, you, some people just need um, someone you know, to hear them out and that's all they need. So your presence is, is what can help and get something started. I mean, Gina, clearly you are doing that in all avenues. I feel like, you know, whether it's your youngest, you know, grandchild all the way up, but how, if we're not as, um, knowledgeable as you are, how do we educate ourselves so that we can be that person that, that a young person turns to? Well, I think there's there's a lot of information that's certainly using social media and using our internet, you can actually go and learn learn about the warning signs. Number one, there's, you know, if there's a TV show, what, what do they enjoy doing? If there's something in the newspaper, I mean, there's, there's, there's many ways. Um, you know, I wasn't always comfortable having those conversations with my kids, but I also realized that I wanted to break the legacy in our family you know, having both my father and, and my brother die suicide at the same age in their lives. And I realized that I can't pretend that my kids or my grandkids aren't gonna be that age. So what do you do? You have a conversation. And I'm, you know, I still don't like having, you know, talking about sex eds with, with my, my kids, even though they're in their late, you know, 30s now. But I do, because I have a responsibility as a parent. But I also have a responsibility as a sister I have a responsibility as a community member, and, and if I'm not comfortable having a specific conversation with one of my children or grandchildren, then I'm gonna call Auntie Deb, or I'm gonna call Uncle Kayla, or I'm gonna you know, get our youth involved that are gonna talk and use words that they can understand and, 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 and people that they can relate to. You know, I think if parents are watching tonight, they probably, and they have a young person that they're worried about in their family, they're probably feeling pretty uh, powerless in a lot of ways. How do we empower parents? If they're not the ones that the kids want to speak to, how do we empower them to find those resources, especially if they are working two jobs and mm -hmm. feeling so busy yeah. and thinking, oh, well, the school will take care of that. They got a counselor, they have mm -hmm. teachers, they have coaches, what have you. Well, absolutely. I think it's just asking that. Who would you like to talk to? Um, and would you like me to help you t set up a time to talk to them? So it's, it's still offering some support. Um, but any way that you can have that conversation, um, I think contributes. So just like this, um, you can start up a conversation anywhere. People, 
say, is that work depressing or hard? And I'm like, no, it's rewarding. Mm -hmm. So have the conversation. Okay. And also, we'll if I could just... last word, please. Well, <laughs> <laughs> my brother always said that. And here's to you, but... I think also that if a parent is worried about a child, they should be calling 1-800-273-TALK because that crisis line will help them to understand what resources available and if, and, if, and if help needs to get there. So there is help, and where there's help, there's hope. Okay, I love that. Where there is help, there is hope. And we have compiled all of that information on our website at PBS Hawaii, so make sure that if you are worried about someone or you yourself have some issues around this, please go to that website. We have a variety of resources from our experts tonight. Mahalo to all of you for joining us. We want to give a special thanks, of course, to our guest, Dr. Deborah Gobert the with the Department of Psychiatry at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, Gina Koulukukui, Program Director at Life Bridges Hawaii Incorporated, Miki Nishizawa, Advisor for Waipahu High School's Youth for Safety Club, and Kealoha Hooper, Program Coordinator for Molokai Child Abuse Prevention Pathways. Insights will be back on April 26. We're taking the next two weeks to get ready for our next Kako Hawaii's Town Hall, which we will bring you live Thursday night, April 19th from 8 to 10. We have about 40 of your fellow Hawaii residents from all over the state coming to our studio to talk about the global squeeze. How can we keep Hawaii Hawaii? We hope you'll join us for this live broadcast and live stream. Please post your comments. We'll be checking with social media throughout the town hall. That is in two weeks. Your next Kako Hawaii's Town Hall right here. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Ho.